Dear viewers, thank you for joining us. You're watching Future Africa Show. This is Obi and Horn of Africa. I am your host, Addis Asafa. Today, I joined by Honorable Roger Ervin via Zoom from United States of America. And he used to work as a policy maker in American politics and in American administration for so many years. And he is here to vote on the ongoing situation in Ethiopia. Honorable uh Roger Ervin, good to have you here. Thank you, glad to be here. You've been uh, watching and observing Ethiopian politics very closely so far. And what is your insight about Ethiopian politics? And uh, can you give us your analysis on the intervention of the US government these days in Ethiopian politics? Sure. Well, I think, uh, I think good things are coming out of Ethiopia from the standpoint of, of a democratic government. You have elected prime minister, a president, a uh, functioning judiciary, uh, elections that have gone gone well, and the rest of the elections I understand will take place at, at some point in time, and that's a good thing. And um, I think most of the world recognizes the government, and you have a president, uh, a prime minister that uh, won a Nobel Prize. So I think that's a great thing. Uh, unfortunately, like um, maybe like the Taliban, uh, you have elements in your country that don't want to accept a democratic government and uh, decided to um, go to take up arms instead of the ballot box. And I think that that's a, um, that's a, that's a very uh, disturbing uh, trend. And hopefully at some point we'll, it, will, it will end. Uh, I think the U.S. government um, is, uh, you know, in a, in a unique place uh, right now in the sense that, uh, you know, they're inwardly focused. The U.S. is inwardly focused on, um, on, on the pandemic and the economy. And so, you know, not everybody's attention is on, on the rest of the world and certainly not on, uh, on, on the day-to-day -day action in Ethiopia. And so um, sometimes I think people are questioning, including myself, what the U.S. position is vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Ethiopia. Generally speaking, having been in policy for a long time, I'll tell you that the, since the Cold War, the, the U.S. policy has been to find ways to support democratic governments everywhere and to support democratic transitions and to find ways to diminish terrorist threats like the Taliban and al-Qaeda and others um, as, as quickly and as swiftly as possible. And that takes a lot of money, a lot of time, and hasn't always been um, successful. And so, um, so it's an evolving policy, and I think that's where we're stuck, stuck right now. As I have said now, you've been uh, serving as a policymaker in American government for uh, so many years, right? Uh, yes. Can you, can, you, can you highlight as uh, foreign policy of United States of America, particularly which is designated to the continent Africa, and specifically to Ethiopia as well? Sure, sure. Uh, well, there's there's uh, four, four or five parts of the U.S. government that, that actually manage foreign policy. Uh, I, I was, uh, I spent my first six years uh, in government working on, in the Congress uh, for, for a young Senator Joe Biden uh, when he was in his early 40s even much younger than I am now. And yeah. uh, I worked for him for about three years. So I've known, I've known Joe Biden for a long time. Uh, I, have, um, I went to work in the House side for, for a number of years and then went to uh, work uh, in the Clinton administration for six years in Africa. And so I was at the, I was at the uh, State Department during the early, uh, the, the ending of, uh, of, the, the, uh, of the GERD and then the beginning of... Uh, of the TPLF government and so uh, EPRDF and so you know I've sort of seen I've seen the evolution of Ethiopia over over now the last thirty years and um, it, it um, you know and so as so as other people so the the, the real the, the real functionalities of the U.S. government takes place in four places one is the State Department the State Department is the diplomatic uh, entity of the U.S. government. And that's led on Africa by, uh, by the Bureau of African Affairs. Um, uh, you know that people like Susan Rice and Johnny Carson and others were there. And that's the, that's the bureau I was in when I was there. And I worked for a guy named George Moose at the time. Uh, the um, National Security Council, 
which is the president's uh, national security staff in the White House, uh, the Department of Defense, which has a um, which has a, a very large Africa presence, and you, as you probably know, Africom, which is the is the battle command for um, for uh, the de- Defense Department, and then a combination of uh, intelligence agencies that um, that that work that have African bureaus as well. There are other places, the Foreign Commercial Service, uh, Department of Justice. There are other places that have Africa entities, but the four basic ones are um, the ones I just outlined. Abi's administration uh, was uh, succeeded the Austin TPLF, right? And yes. you know both administration as your hand is palm, and uh, you know you know you know you know what's going on in Ethiopia, uh, regime after regime. You 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 do have um, keen understanding on what was going on in Ethiopia and what uh, have been going on in Ethiopia, right? Yes. How do you compare and contrast the two regimes, the new administration which leading the country versus the Oster TPLF? I don't think there's any comparison at all. Uh, the, the EPRDF uh, government led by the TPLF uh, was a crony government. It was uh, run by a dictator, someone who I, I had known uh, from a long time ago. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we thought he was going to be more democratic than he turned out to be, at least from the U.S. side, we thought that. And he, you know, basically TPLF ran a dictatorship for 27 years, and that dictatorship was uh, was marred by uh, human rights violations, imprisoning political prisoners, uh, you know, uh, sham elections, and uh, and when they were run out of government, that was the right thing to do, and the people of Ethiopia spoke and wanted a different government in and held elections, and we have the government we have today, and that's that's how the legitimate process should go. And uh, no matter what, you know, unfortunately, war war brings out the worst in, in, in most people. It, it's a very hard uh, process to manage and things happen. But the reality is we have a legitimate government that was elected by the majority of Ethiopians. And that government is the government should stand. And we shouldn't allow anyone in the world to take up the, a, a gun just because they don't like the government. It's one thing. If you are saying that the majority of citizens are repressed by a government, then there's, there's a there's, you can make an argument that uh, you know any insurrection is justified. But when you have a government that's elected by majority of the citizens and elected in a democratic way, uh, there's no place for a re- revolution. And we have or confederacy, and that's what we had in our country at one point in the 1860s where there was one part of the country, a minority part of the country, that did not want to uh, abide by the law. They wanted slavery in all 50 states. And when they didn't get it, and they didn't get their economic um, uh, choice, they went, to, uh, they went to the gun. And it took us four years and over a million deaths for, for the country to stabilize and to you know, put down the insurrection. And uh, there are many other places that have had similar things. And uh, I'm afraid Ethiopia may be um, going down that path. And I, I hope that uh, uh, cooler heads in the TPLF will, will prevail and come to the table and negotiate with the legitimate government of Ethiopia. You just uh, discussed all the evil things are, and all the evil acts of TBLF, it's about uh, maladministration, violation, mass uh, violation of human rights, so forth. And uh, we can generally put it as a very dictator and autocrat regime. But having, saying all this, uh, still the very democrat nation, United States of America is beside this tragic maker. Uh, why the United States of America preferred to back up TPLF and again chose to give a cold shoulder to the very legitimate administration of uh, Dr. Abiy Ahmed? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I won't say that the Americans have thrown all of their weight behind the TPLF. I think that, uh, as I said, I think that the U.S. is mainly focused, you know, the, the whole conflict started uh, before the Biden administration was in office. 
And uh, they sort of, they would probably say in, inherited the, the issue. And when they came in, the main focus of the president and the White House and most of the, the cabinet was on um, ending the pandemic. And, and, and you also have a period of time in the US government where it takes time to put new officials in office. And, and to this day, the Senate hasn't approved all the leaders, including the one for the Africa Bureau. And so it, you have those times where, where US policy can be fragmented among different agencies. The, the Defense Department could have one vision on this, the, the State Department could have another vision. And I get the sense that they're trying to consolidate that position and they're looking for a way to, to negotiate a settlement here instead of doing what they probably should do, which is to condemn the TPLF and cut off the TPLF's lines of supplies and financing to, to try to bring this conflict to an end. They had uh, made a cut on some staffs and uh, restricted visa for higher government officials. And as a, a very senior policy maker of the United States of America, what does this Ed cut signify? I think it's a great question. Um, like I said, I, I go back to the point, I think that the U.S. is trying to do what they call create a balance approach to both sides. And so they sanction, they sanction TPLF uh, senior officials as well. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, fortunately, I guess um, they, they cut the aid to show that they were doing something with the government as well and sanctioned uh, you know, uh, senior officials in, in the Ethiopian government. And they thought that they would, um, they could do the same with the TPLF. Unfortunately, it's a rebel group, so you don't have a lot of leverage over a rebel organization. So I think they think that they're being balanced here to try to bring both parties to the table. But the reality is, is that the TPLF is in the wrong here. And um, uh, it's not it's not an equal blame, uh, even though there may be, you know, the government may have had a few missteps over the, the last few months. Uh, but but they are legitimately in, in the right to, to defend the, defend the country. So I think I think that uh, I, I don't know that I, I'm not sure that having been in this situation before, I'm not sure that the U.S. government, at least most of the people in the U.S. government are supporting of supporting the TPLF. There, there could be some, there's always, you know, people on both sides and you sort of have to, you know, balance those viewpoints. And uh, it's up to, at the end of the day, it's up to the president to balance, balance those viewpoints. But generally speaking, what I see is them trying to walk a fine line to, to, to create a balance on both sides, which, you know, usually when you do that, um, it doesn't get you anywhere, especially when um, one side is more culpable for the violence and starting this than the other side? Uh, during last November, while the TPLF uh, atrociously attacked the Northern military base, uh, American uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo under Trump administration tilted and acknowledged that the TPLF started the war by attacking the National Northern Command Arteria. The U.S. knows who started the war. It was the TPLF. So is there a country that tolerates uh, seeing or encountering such tragic incident in its sovereign affairs and its uh, sovereignty? Uh, no, I don't think that any country would tolerate that. And uh, I, think it was in the, I think it was in the government's uh, authority to respond to the attack. And uh, uh, I think that was fine. So what is expected from Ethiopian government swiftly work and bring the usual bilateral relationship with uh, American government and things these days are not good here and people are uh, get offended with the intervention of the US government and what uh, do you exactly urge uh, to the people in White House in understanding the ongoing truths on the ground? The, the, the government of Ethiopia uh, and, and the U.S. need to talk more frequently and, uh, and have that dialogue be robust and get down to some solutions. Uh, I think that the, 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 the leverage uh, needs to be placed against the TPLF to give up arms. Uh, I think that uh, the U.S., and I'm sure that they are doing some of this, they need to 
engage Sudan, Egypt, um, Kenya, and others to uh, stay out of uh, the situation and, and allow uh, and, and, and to use the, o, the AU, is a, the African Union, as a way to exert, you know, uh, the, the African, um, uh, you know, the African leadership in, uh, in helping to resolve this. And uh, in the Middle East and other players need to back up so that we can get a we can get this resolved faster. And and I think that um, the government needs to you know understand that um, while while the blockade and uh, and trouble getting uh, uh, getting humanitarian supplies into Tigray uh, have been problems. Those aren't the main problems. The main problems are to stop the violence. So now that the TPLF has expanded into Afar and Asmara, um, in, uh, into uh, uh, As Asmara province, uh, then yeah, it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's-, yeah, it's Afar it's even, and Amhara. Afar and Amhara, sorry, I got it backwards. Yeah. <laughs> Talking too fast. Yeah. That, that this, is, this, is, this has the risk of being countrywide. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Feltman and others need to uh, exacerbate trying to find a solution to this and a solution that keeps the government uh, in power and uh, brings the TPLF to, to the table to, um, to participate in democracy and not uh, violence. Samantha Power uh, paid a visit to Ethiopia last week and she, comment she commented that there has to be a negotiation between the rebel TPLF and the Ethiopian uh, government, the incumbent leadership. And uh, is there any country which is uh, mandated or governed by USAID um, staff or head to negotiate on its internal affairs or Ethiopia is the only one? Um, I think uh, I I think is probably not. It may have looked like that, but I don't really think that that's um, what it was about with her. Uh, you know, aid has been you know a, an issue that the the, the press has covered. Uh, aid getting into Tigray and Afar and in other areas, and uh, so she's being in charge of aid. I think that uh, that they that there was an expectation for her to go out and to. To view what was what was going on in the field, and to you know, and to help help articulate what what the U.S. wants, uh, but uh, I don't think that she is in a position to negotiate. I think that's probably Mr. Feltman or or uh, you know Mr. Blinken or others um, to do that. Um, that's a function of the State Department, not the not USAID. We have discussed uh, what uh, TPLF has done in Ethiopian politics, and uh, it changed from bad to worse these days. But the US and the European Union are always uh, yelling about a humanitarian crisis in uh, Tigray regional state. Which one would weigh more? Is a humanitarian crisis there in Tigray or losing? A military base. Yeah, I, I well, my my stand, uh, if it means anything, it's just me as an individual citizen. Uh, I mean, you know, clearly ending the violence throughout the whole country is the main objective. Mm -hmm. And as much as you can, you need to get humanitarian aid into any area where it's threatened. And uh, having, you know, being being someone who's you know formerly run an aid an aid uh, organization, you know, that's that's a very difficult to, thing to do. While you have uh, while you have fighting going on, and the government, um, for its part, needs to do its best to try to get humanitarian aid, humanitarian aid in there. And I think that they are trying to do that. But the overriding goal is to stop a rebellion in, in your country, and and that's very very difficult for anybody to prosecute. It was, and you know, I mentioned earlier the U.S. Civil War. It was in those days. It was equally hard. So um, it's just something that uh, is an unfortunate part of fighting. But so to me, like in our situation, it is, it is incumbent upon the TPLF to come to the table and negotiate a, a settlement that works under a democratically elected government. And right now they still want to go to arms. And so the government is in a position where it has to, 
you know, try and, and provide humanitarian assistance and, and ease the suffering of all citizens. And I know the prime minister had mentioned that. He mentioned that, you know, all, most the, the people in Tigray are Ethiopian citizens, except for these rebels who are decided to not be. Uh, so, you know, the, the prime minister knows it's his responsibility to try to feed and clothe uh, and provide medical assistance for, for people in those areas. But it's very difficult when you have another side trying to do that. In this situation, the, the, the government, you know, it's the government's responsibility to try to ensure that its troops are acting appropriately and under the Geneva Convention and so forth and so on. Uh, but, you know, on the other side, you don't have that responsibility. They're, they just they can just do whatever they want to do until someone stops them. So um, obviously ending the fighting is the most important thing you can do for humanitarian assistance, but uh, it has to be done in a way in which you don't tear the country apart. And right. I think the prime minister has said that on many occasions. Ethiopian American Civic Council led by Diakon Yosef Tefre contributed a great deal in making HR uh, 128 passed by the U.S. Congress. Woman Karen Bass co-wrote the bill exposed the human rights abuses of the TPLF while in power. Why does the U.S. Congress now believe that the same TPLF is a good guy? <laughs> That's a that's a question you're going to have to ask them. I don't understand. I think Karen Bass understands that. I think a lot of people are confused, especially if you've not really been exposed to what happens in a situation where you have an armed group trying to, you know, trying to uh, prosecute an insurrection. Uh, I think people sort of under, misunderstand what happens there. But it clearly, clearly, the TPLF has for a long time been a terrorist organization, especially in the last three years. And they've, you know, they they presided over uh, a, a, an authoritarian government for a long time that jailed people, and even the judge of the NBE and EBE uh, was jailed twice. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there there are people who can still, you know, testify to that. So, uh, you know, I I, I work with uh, with Deacon Yusuf and. Uh, uh, and, and the EACC, and we're trying our best to get to uh, members of Congress, including Congresswoman Bass. And we recently had a, had a meeting with her and uh, Deacon Yusuf and other uh, uh, diaspora leaders um, pled the case and tried to, make, tried to help her understand what the situation is and why it was so important to pass H.R. 128. And that goes against what some people are saying now. I'm very, um, I'm very alarmed, uh, and so is so are members of the Ethiopian American Civic Council are alarmed at um, so many people in the decision making realm in the U.S. and in the media have been swallowing hook, line, and sinker the line that the TPLF is somehow, uh, you know, uh, the victim of 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 government violence. When in fact they started it, as you said, they they attacked the the command, they, they, they had their own elections against the, against Ethiopian law, against constitutional law, and in, you know, all other kinds of things. I mean, they're, 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 their issues go back a long ways. And people are now, uh, you know, just, just swallowing and believing uh, everything that someone feeds them about uh, what's going on uh, in Ethiopia. And, you know, as you know, uh, there's a very, very large diaspora of Ethiopians, uh, from all all uh, parts of the country in the U.S. and uh, and and you know the the expats uh, the um, excuse me the 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 um, diaspora cares desperately about um, about Ethiopia and uh, want want to help, but uh, some seem to have a a a, a, a voice with with uh, with people in Washington that it really is is not legitimate. And uh, the other day there was a really disturbing. Uh, Edit, uh, editorial board piece in the Washington Post that at the end talked about uh, the, um, uh, the the the, uh, the 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 administration of Dr. Abby being inhumane and <laughs> it it was almost like they were reading a TPLF uh, press release and that was really disturbing because that's that's not even close to the truth and uh, we we're working uh, diligently to get out the truth. So that people understand what is happening uh, in Ethiopia, uh, something that's emanating from a province that has five million people, and affecting 
uh, the lives of 110 other million people. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmad is diligently working uh, to bring uh, peace in the Horn region, right? So yeah. w what is your prediction in conjunction with the U.S. government? Uh, does U.S. need a stable Horn of Africa? Uh, you, you can uh, substantiate my question with what happened in Taliban, Libya, Iraq, you see, Yemen, you name it, right? Uh, I'm always, after you know, 35 years of doing this, I'm always amazed at uh, how um, you know, people don't see the bigger picture and don't see how, what the benefit is of, 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 of uh, moving towards a democratic government in each country and then working together as a region. If, if the Horn of Africa, and if you include Sudan, Egypt, Somalia, um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, you know, yeah. or Kenya in that mix, that would be a super strong economic organization. I mean, they would, they would rival almost everyone in the world, but they haven't gotten there because I believe some countries have an, an interest in keeping, keeping the stabilization in the area. Uh, in some end of, in some organizations, uh, you know, Boko Haram uh, is a good example. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Al Shabaab, I guess, is what's called in Somalia. Uh, you know, they have a they they want destabilization. Uh, there are organizations in Egypt that want the same. So th these countries all need to recognize that they're better together than they are apart. And there are ways to solve issues like. Uh, you know, the Renaissance Dam and uh, other issues uh, related to, uh, you know, Eritrea and Somalia and, um, and, and Sudan in particular, uh, that make that would help to make that region more powerful. And I applaud uh, Prime Minister Abbey for that vision, because I think that that's the right vision. And this is the right time to do it. Uh, you've been serving almost for about uh, three decades and plus five years, right? Yes. And uh, you're very senior and you know what's going on in the world and you know what is the intention of the U.S. whenever U.S. is talking about certain countries' politics now and then. Yep. So how do you sum up what I just forwarded now to you? Well, I would say that, uh, I would just say that my contention, and I would just not, not myself, this is, this is becoming more prevailing attitude, I think, in the in the policy circles, is that I think the U.S. needs to needs to uh, consolidate a policy that um, that 100 percent supports democratically elected governments in the region and across the world, but certainly in the region and um, work towards getting stability uh, and to do do that in a very. Uh, aggressive and unfortunately, it, it's it's an expensive way uh, to ensure that we don't have the air the, the region fall back into the hands of those who only want conflict and destabilization and corruption. And um, that you know the, the region is on the line. Uh, it it can be successful, but it's going to take a lot of help. And and the U.S. needs to be there. And that means that the U.S. has to back the, the good governments. And uh, that means, you know, continuing democracy in Kenya, uh, continuing democracy in Ethiopia, uh, putting down rebels like the TPLF, uh, you know, bringing Sudan more into, uh, into the fold on, on democracy, the same thing in Egypt, which they're not. And, uh, and then finally in, uh, in, in you know, and something has to happen in Eritrea as well. But the region can be there, but it's got to get there fast. And it's got to get there with the, with the help of not only the U.S., but the Europeans and the Asians. And everybody's going to be on the same page. And I don't believe that the Chinese and Russians are playing uh, a fair game here either. And they need to, they need to contribute in, 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 in investing in stability and not instability. Okay, at last, do you have any remark that you want to address or do you have anything that you want to urge the U.S. Uh, government, the Biden administration, the Ethiopian government in conjunction with the ongoing uh, situation in the U.S. in meddling in Ethiopian sovereign affairs and uh, the Ethiopian uh, government 
being offended by the U.S. intervention and uh, forgetting the reality on the ground and uh, being propagating the false narrative of TPLF while the truth is uh, laid on the ground. Do you have anything well, to say? Yeah, thanks. I, well, you know, I can't really give, I can't really give the U.S. government any advice. Uh, uh, they wouldn't take it anyway. Uh, but I, I would just as an observer, I would say that um, that the, the government needs to consolidate its position in Ethiopia and then move forward aggressively on that. I think what happened in Afghanistan was a uh, was a telltale sign of things that can happen other places. And I think that the, the, the government needs the U.S. government, the highest levels and I mean the highest levels, need to sit down with Prime Minister Abbey, understand where, what his objectives are, and he needs to understand what the U.S. objectives are, and trying to find a meeting place and then figure out how they're going to deal with this rebel group. Uh, the U.S. and Ethiopia have a long history, a long good history, and you know sometimes not good, but the potential for this relationship being extremely good for Ethiopians and Americans is there, and we just need to find a place. And I think that, that that to me is the biggest threat to the TPLF, that the US and the Abbey administration will see eye to eye and work on common objectives. And the goal of the TPF is to disrupt that. Uh, so my hope is that both governments will, will find a place to work together. They need to first understand each other. And that, that comes through dialogues, not through tweets and, uh, and you know, uh, short-term press releases. It means real sustained dialogue, like I said, at the highest levels to try to get to um, a solution. And when they get to a place where they understand each other and can work together, then they can go and find a way to tackle the TPLF. And the other, the other players in the, regions need, in the region need to stay out of that relationship. Okay, uh, Honorable Roger Ervin, thank you for your scholarly analysis and uh, giving us this uh, insight about our ongoing situation in Ethiopia. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, time flies. I would like to wrap up my discussion with Honorable Roger Ervin, a long-serving policy maker in American uh, government, and he tried to uh, discuss reality on the ground uh, in Ethiopian politics. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye. See you next time with another edition. Have a good one. Take care.